is my number 10 board game. Circadian's First Light is my number 9 game. Maracaibo is my number 8 game. Aeon's End is my number 7 game. Obsession is my number 6 game of 2020. Best, the storytelling. Each baddie you face is going to play so differently and so unique and have a different story. And within that story, your story could fork off and go in different directions and be different each time you play it based on the success you're having or the difficulties you're having. Yes, the general idea is the same, and yes, the narrative pushes you in a certain way, but you've got to work your tail to get there. And the story along the way is fantastic. Your achievements, the further you get in, oh, I didn't get past this chapter, and now I'm getting to the next one, the second play, it really is okay with me, especially if you think something like the time story's worst. Like most us against the board, it can be an exercise in futility. You don't, you're, you got the wrong heroes, too many monsters have overrun, you can't move around, there's just a slow death by doom. There's many ways that you just bleed out slowly and although the game says that you can just put a new character in when one dies, it kind of feels wrong. I always want to stop playing after the characters die but I slowly started to adapt pulling more in and, and that really has made the game a little bit better in terms of that exercise in futility because you get a new, uh, pick a new character based on what you kind of need in that moment and kind of breathes life into that game. Although the more characters you continue to add, that does draw out that game length um, as you just keep giving yourself more lives. Best, the modular board. There were so many people that were fans of second edition that were really scared off by this board and it was put off. And I admit, the first time I looked at it, I thought it was ugly. But as I got those modular board pieces in my hand and really took a look at that art, it's gorgeous, it's beautiful. Then I was able to see with each scenario what they were able to do. Different uh, locations are available. The streets are a new location. Come into the new expansion, the Under D Deep Waters, or I'm sorry, the Under Dark Waters expansion. They now have uh, railways and uh, 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 highways that can get you to places much faster and you're jumping around the map and moving in. It just adds so, uh, so much more choice um, and flexibility in the game. It's just so wonderful. Best. There is an array of hero choices for you at the beginning of each game, and each expansion just gives you more of those choices. It really is phenomenal to just hear read more about their stories, check out their advantages, and I really love that with these heroes, they give those, those three specific hero cards that are for your hero that you start off with. One for sure, and two, you have to choose one or the other. It's really nice. It helps you decide which way you want to play the game with that character based on who you paired them up with, perhaps, if you're playing more than one character. Um, it's really fantastic, these heroes. They're some of my favorite in all of games. Worst. It is now two expansions in, one small and one big, and it's becoming kind of a beast to set up. There's still all those cards uh, that you have got to set up each time. You got to reset the monster deck. I love the new monster deck over the monster cup, but really shuffling and finding all the monsters you need for setup is quite a pain. Uh, there's always going to be, there's no more rules to follow. There's new, the codex, as much as I love the storytelling that comes from it, there's still going to be some organizing and trying to figure out where it is and, and stuff like that. So it's still kind of a beast to set up. I do wonder if they would ever just make an app for the location encounters. It would free up so much space in having those six or seven uh, location encounter cards on your table just really just eats up that space. For me, I think that'd be a great way to implement an app uh, to this game. Best. I kind of hinted on this before with the uh, with the baddies in them all being unique, but one thing I really love is there are unique cards that go into the game for the scenario that you have. Like you add them to this, I don't remember the name of this uh, special unique card, but there are specific ones that will tell you, go in and get this card. And that card ties to the adventure you're having. It's just another level to that storytelling and really getting you just enveloped into that theme of what's going on and the theme of Arkham. And to me, when I fell in love with Arkham Second Edition, that's what it was. It was the town, running around the town, and it's mostly about the town. I wanted to go back to Arkham. I wanted to save Arkham. It was all for Arkham. Oh no, we let Arkham, uh, the terror increases, another shop closes. Well, these cards are just another way of introducing more theme into the game you're playing and it's wonderful. Worst, despite the array of hero choices, there is no Harvey Walters. Best, I actually love playing this game 
two-handed. Traditionally, I am a one-handed kind of guy. I only like to deal with one person, one, one character. I don't like to have to manage and balance two different things. To me, it's a lot of extra work that I don't want to do. I want it streamlined and quick, but here in Arkham Horror 3rd Edition, because you only get two actions, it's really important to pair those up. And I absolutely love the pairing of these heroes, trying to figure out who am I going to have be a monster hunter and who am I going to have trying to progress the story and do my doom do maintenance and research. It's really fun to try to pair them up and make a team. And I, what I really like about it is as a team, this game is really just about managing the board in front of you and slowly making progress to your goal. So picking those two members, you're saying, I'm gonna have you take care of this, I'm gonna have you take care of this, and then go forth. And those four actions feel just enough to deal with everything that the board has done to you. And, and I really think the board is, doing the board's actions really makes this game so fun because it's laying out the, the path in front of you. It's saying, this is the challenge. Can you overcome it? Arkham Horror is my number five game of 2020. Best. Taking, serving, and betting a guest is oddly satisfying in this game. There's something about just picking a guest, filling his food order, preparing a room, and getting him into that room to score points and gain the benefit is just so satisfying in this game. I absolutely love it. It's mundane. It's silly that it's even called a game, doing those things, but there's something about that. There's something about that process that really just I absolutely adore. Worst, there's not a lot of dice manipulation available to you as a player. This game is based on the dice roll. Those are the actions that are available and the strengths of those actions. So the fact that you don't have a really good way of making yourself more powerful or adaptable and adapt the dice for you is kind of disappointing. Um, the action, the pass action allows you to re-roll the dice, but you have to discard like three dice before by the time it gets back to you. And with only having, I can't remember, I think it's 10 dice, you have only six or five dice at, at that point to really get what you want and the odds are actually less than before that you'll get what you want. So it's, it's, it's really unforgiving in that area. Best. The objectives, the A, B, C cards that you place out at the, at the beginning of every game, they're challenging and they give you a direction. This game is very fast, so keeping your eyes on the prize is key, and these objectives do a great job of doing that. Worst, and this is a kind of a really big one for me, and it's the uh, guest availability cards. You're drawing those cards every turn, and you have the choice to just take a guest and pay some money if you want a higher priced guest, or that one that's you know hasn't been out there as long, but. If you need a yellow room filled and there are no yellow or green guests, you are stuck. You can't get that guest. I've played a bunch of games where I needed one more blue guest to finish my objective and score 15 points, and a blue or green guest did not come. I say green because green's wild. You might be not know that, not knowing the game. But, yeah, so you're matching those colors for those guests, and if you don't get that, that right guest, you're kind of just screwed. Best, the hotel staff cards. I absolutely love the powers they give you, the rules they let you break, and the synergy that they can create when you pair a couple of them together. It's a wonderful little engine you can build. But you have to be really careful not to get caught up in those because they don't usually allow you to score a lot of victory points. There are end game ones which can be really game changing. But if you just try to get too much staff out there and not pay attention to your guests or your rooms, you may end up with the worst hotel in Austria. Best, I like that the player boards have the variable hotel starting um, option. You've got the one side that is uh, universal for all of them, but you've got four other boards that change the groupings of the rooms. Pair that with uh, all the other differences that can occur in the game. It really adds to some phenomenal replayability. Best, all the goodies you can get. Benefits from staff, benefits from gas, benefits from closing rooms, benefits from groupings of rooms, benefits from the emperor track. There's just so many things that you can get goodies and points from, mostly goodies, and then the goodies turn into points because, yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, there's, you're just, you're getting so many things here. If you play it right, it just can turn into a really fun thing. Grand Austria Hotel is my number four game of 2020. Best. This game has an amazing playtime versus depth of strategy and weight ratio. You can truly in solo get a game done in about 30 minutes um, and have just as heavy and thinky thought and process to it um, in comparison to the amount of time you have to spend on something like Dracarian or even bigger. It's really, really wonderful to get that depth 
in just such a short playtime and with such easy mechanics. It's really quite amazing. Worst. Uh, although some of the Elder cards are kind of duplicates of the ones that are already in play for you as a solo player, not having access to all of them is kind of disappointing. Uh, the Elders are really fantastic and you love those powers and you just wonder what uh, wonderful powers you're missing out on without being able to play with those other cards. But it's a small problem uh, as it doesn't affect the gameplay itself. It just maybe affects that replayability just the tiniest little bit. Best, trying to find those building synergy combos uh, within each deck. It's really fun to try to see how one building, an A building, can lead to a B building or have an effect on a C building. It's just really fun to kind of string those together and look for those wonderful paths. Worst, I do feel that the shares mechanic in a solo play kind of becomes one dimensional. It's simply just about uh, not losing the victory points. Well, I, mean, I guess it's not one dimensional. You're not losing victory points and you're getting more fish, but you really miss out on that play of other people buying your shares um, and having an effect of, of getting um, extra fish that way. So you miss out on that mechanic, which I just think is a really clever thing, and I wish there's some way to incorporate it in that solo play. Best. This game is kind of a low-key build-your-own-player board game in terms of the abilities um, or rules that the buildings you build let you break. There's certain things you're going to be able to do or trades you'll be able to make that others can't, so it's really interesting to get those extra actions. It's kind of in the same vein of Maracaibo and Obsession that were on my top 10 list this year where you're kind of building up your actions so each game kind of feels differently based on the cards or the buildings you decided to take. Best, I absolutely love the feeling of building up that fleet, that fishing fleet. So much so that many times I overbuild and catch too many fish that I just can't do anything with. There's just so addicting to get those ships, upgrade those ships, and those ships earn your points at the end of the game too. Um, and I really love pairing that with a building that gives you bonus points for having a shipping fleet of of so many uh, of value or possibly so many different types of ships in your shipping fleet. It's just a really fun mechanic. Best. There are just so, so many ways to score victory points. Am I going to max out fish and get a, a building that allows me to trade fish in for victory points at the end? Am I going to try to go down the gold road and collect gold through uh, the connection of buildings I can build? Um, am I going to try to uh, organize my board orthogonally, adjacently with buildings that match up together? There really is seems like with four different decks that play so differently and have different combinations to find, there just really seems like an endless combination of victory point paths. Newsfjord is my number three game of 2020. <laughs> Best, the Automa is a breeze and is very competitive. I absolutely love the ease in which you can play the AI. Simple turn of a card, addition of a cube, moving an egg or two along the way. It is just so delicate and dainty to handle. It really matches the theme and feel of the multiplayer and game itself. It's just so wonderfully done. I absolutely love that it's not obtrusive and doesn't get in the way but you can still really have a good competition with it. Worst, I'm not good at it and consistency seems to be pretty hard. I scored in the 70s when I first started playing. I got to 80s and 90s at some point in the last three, four games I've played, I've been in the 60s. It really just seems that it's really hard to be consistently good um, in this game, which can just be very frustrating. Best, the playtime is phenomenal. You can play two or three games in an hour span you can, that way, the hurt of not being good or consistent gets refreshed really quickly. It doesn't stick very long. You don't feel really disappointed in the way it played out because you can get right back to it again. Worst, this game is deck diving at its finest. You need a certain type of bird in a certain t uh, a location. You gotta look for it. You need a bird that has a certain nest type. You gotta go look for it. You need birds to match your end goals. You gotta go look for it. This is a game where you can really get caught up in just diving deeper and deeper into the deck. Best. I absolutely love the bird facts. I'm someone who doesn't really get into flavor text and theme very much, um, especially during the game. I can really get caught up in the mechanics, scoring victory points and all that stuff. But I absolutely love just taking a moment when I see a bird that's interesting 
read a little bit about it. It's really phenomenal. I absolutely love that tidbit in the game. Worst, there's just so much pressure on your opening hand to decide what route you're gonna take. A bad hand is almost like a bad settlement, a road placement at the beginning of Catan. It could lead to just a really frustrating experience where you never really feel like anything starts to click. I've heard people talk about taking mulligans and I tried it for an opening hand and I actually like that addition. Just having that flexibility to look and find and pair something together with the round goals, my end goals, and the cards that I have in my hand. Best. Success feels really good. When you hit that engine, when you figure it out, when you're tucking cards, when you're laying eggs, it really feels like you figured something out and you have a wonderful engine that you built. Best. I love all the different varied types of powers birds can have. You've got your immediate. You've got your when activated. You've got your when other players would activate it. You've got your end of round powers. And even if you have all the expansions, then you have the end of game powers. There's just so many different ways these birds can help you and feed your engine that it's so fun to explore the combination of them all. Wingspan is my number two game of 2020. Best. I absolutely love just having to make the most out of each hand and the kind of uh, tableau you've built each round. You get another go at it. Here's another hand, another go at it. Another hand, another go at it. It's really, really fun to try to keep up with what the villain's trying to do versus what you're trying to build to stop it and overcome. And the fact that it can reset each round, each hand you draw, you get to try something a little bit new. It's really, really engaging and it's hard to stop. I say, just one more turn and I'll stop. Just one more turn and I'll stop. The turns are just so fun. It's really hard to just find a good stopping point. Worst, there is just so much content to keep up with. There, we're now getting to a point uh, uh, where I'm a couple heroes behind, a couple villains behind. It's just hard to find the time to keep up and the inspiration to get all of it. There's some heroes I'm just really not interested in playing. I think about if I buy a hero, I've got to figure out some more storage. I've got to do a little bit more setting up each time. Um, it just, there seems to be a point where, at least for me, I need to take a step back and stop and just jump in where I want. And I think I'm at that point already. Best. One of the most miraculous things about this game is how each hero plays so differently and thematically. I feel like I could gush over the way these decks play. Hulk smashes. Cap can do it all day. Black Widow sets it up and responds and counterattacks. Doctor Strange uses his book of invocations. It is just so wonderful to see how these heroes play out. It's so addicting. You may not think you're interested in a hero like Ant-Man, but when you can jump between three different forms in a game, which no one else can do, you want to play that hero more and really get to know Everything that his mechanics or her mechanics can do. It's just so exciting. Worst. I'm not really blown away by the baddie choices. You've got Rhino and Claw. And then you get in one of the first expansion, the Wrecking Crew. Phenomenal mechanics. Really cool game mechanics. But I'm not itching to see how Hulk does against those puny jailbreakers. I'm not really excited to see what Doctor Strange can do against Rhino. or It just sometimes doesn't mesh up thematically, which is so weird to not get behind Hulk just taking some clobbering time on the Green Goblin and seeing what would happen. Actually, as I talk about it, I think that's what I want to play after this recording. Best. They sell the hero packs as a fully constructed deck. You don't need anything else to play that hero, which really makes... Uh, just changing the heroes and playing it leisurely, really amazing. You don't have to think about what uh, cards to add or count them out or what's the limit of this type versus this type and the combination of them. They did all that work for you. Someone told you that this is probably the best way to play this hero thematically and how he's meant to. Now, you can do adaptation. You can do changing. Uh, but for me, I'm more of a leisure player. You just want to uh, set them up and knock them down. Is such a wonderful pairing. 
uh, the characters' abilities with the decks they've already made. Worst, things can get a little checky. Your villains can get things attached to them, and your uh, environments can change, and your schemes can have uh, extra things that trigger, and side schemes, and even conditions. You're just having to check a lot of things. It's easy to forget that maybe when I do this, I actually get to heal something. You definitely have to play checker, checker, checker many times. Um, worse with some heroes than others, but it's almost always there with the villains. Best multi-use cards. I talked about earlier about how you get to make the most of your hand each round. Well, that decision entitles, what am I gonna play and what cards am I gonna use to pay for those cards? There's such a nice pull in those moments to say, I really, really love this card's ability, but I can't afford it. I only have five cards in my hand and two of them I wanna play, the other three I've gotta pay for them, but they both cost two. I'm only gonna get to play one of them this turn. It really is such a nice little knife fight in a phone booth every turn to try to figure out what's the best thing I can do with what I have in my tableau and the five or six or four cards I have in my hand at this time. Drawing extra cards is such a wonderful thing in this game. You feel so powerful when you get even just one extra card to see if you have that extra resource or something available, affordable. It's just such a wonderful mechanic and how tight uh, and, and polished it is. Best. The ease of setting it up and doing it again. You, If you blow through it, you can try it against the expert mode um, by changing one card of the villain. You can even change out one set of standard kind of events with some event, uh, hardcore events. Even if you don't, it, your, change, your reset is even faster. With a change of two or three decks and a shuffle real quick, you're at it again. With a different hero, against a different villain, or even the same one. It's just it's so easy to play that it's hard to stop. Marvel Champions is my number one game of 2020. That's another episode of Han Solo Board Gaming in the books. You're seeing two videos on your screen right now. One was put there by artificial intelligence, tracking your every move, and one was put there by me. Make sure you click on the one you prefer so we can see who knows you better. Until next time, thanks for watching.